my name is Denis Kumayunov. I'm a senior researcher of the Lomonosov of Moscow State University, Russia. And my uh, co-speaker Svetlana is my PhD student, and we're going to present uh, our work on shell code detection. Uh, part of the presentation will be mine, and uh, the most, the rest of the presentation, the most valuable part will be presented by Svetlana. Um, I will try to speak a little bit about motivation of our work and the uh, state of the art. Uh, and the rest of the presentation will be uh, about our uh, proposed approach and uh, its implementation and the evaluation results and everything and so on. And this will be done by Svetlana. I hope. I hope she will not leave me alone here. <laughs> okay. Uh, the first question which people tend to ask when they hear about shellcode detection in 2013 is, why should we care about it? It's about uh, two decades or maybe more uh, when people are trying to, well, people actually do uh, memory corruption overflows and exploitation, and, and maybe this problem should have been solved already. Uh, yeah, it's, it's even, uh, there are even jokes on the internet about knob sleds, which you may find in comics. Uh, and there are a lot of cons. Why should anyone care about shellcode detection. It's, it's, it, it seems like old. We have, we have around here Fed 2, 0, and clouds, and SCADA in the clouds, and everything. And some will say that this is a little bit strange. Uh, and uh, if we look at some statistics, so for example, Microsoft's uh, these statistics is about a uh, year and a half uh, of in age, and uh, it states that uh, the number one reason for um, malware propagation, for example, today is user unawareness. It's when, when people just don't know that you shouldn't run those executables that are and that come to us as attachments, for example. Uh, and this reason uh, is about, well, 60% maybe of uh, malware installations. And the uh, next one is, I don't remember which, which exactly, and the third one is uh, memory corruptions exploited, exploited remotely, and they possess only uh, less than 1% of all cases were malware installed on the end user systems. And it's, it may seem that uh, end, end user, uh, endpoint security products work well. Well, we have a lot of antivirus software which may be deployed on any kind of modern operating system. I, I mean, Microsoft products is ahead, but we have uh, Linux flavor antiviruses for uh, mail servers, tops, and so on. So we have a bunch of endpoint security products which are known to users, and users uh, know, know how to use it. And that's why should we care? But well, the last half of a year. Uh, helped me a lot, me personally a lot in this talk, because we had several sim uh, sequential cases of uh, zero days in Java. And before the last uh, spring, last, well, last spring, yeah, uh, we can remember a remote, uh, a remotely exploitable vulnerability in Microsoft. Uh, remote desktop service, which uh, didn't actually, uh, uh, it, it wasn't necessary to have any 
any identity in the network which uh, uh, ran, ran uh, to, to successfully run this exploit and get uh, the privilege escalation remotely. Uh, And uh, if we imagine ourselves as uh, people who are trying to mitigate such risks, uh, what can we actually do? Uh, because antiviruses, endpoint security products, they act uh, proactively. They, they actually do act proactively, but very in very limited uh, uh, scale. And, and our own, for example, our own uh, penetration testing experience shows that it, it's quite often too uh, easy to uh, shut down antivirus service uh, while exploiting the remotely exploitable vulnerability like this, and, and that's all. Um, and, and, and it may be, it, it would be interesting for, for me personally as a user of some detector to uh, distinguish from, for example, attacks which are detected by Snort or some other anti-intrusion uh, detection systems, um, or uh, when, when, they're, when they give false positives uh, for executives' download, or some, something like that, to distinguish from uh, cases when script kiddies take Metasploit from them and uh, try to find vulnerabilities in my network. Mm, of course, uh, uh, many of us uh, heard about advanced persistence threats and uh, targeted attacks of critical infrastructure. Uh, we think that this may be also a, a kind of market for uh, tools that allow to some uh, extent detection of unknown malware, unknown shell code explodes. Oh, the good example. We uh, we have a CTF team uh, in Moscow State University, and uh, I used to play uh, with my students also in CTF, and it's kind of very. Uh, uh, Situation where which can be um, ten, uh, tense and feeling it, when when you're um, defending your uh, setup, uh, and it's uh, kind of, it's kind of in the middle of the game. Uh, you have you see that your uh, vulnerable services are getting uh, to show strange behavior. It's like uh, someone found already uh, the vulnerability and ex exploiting and getting the flags. But you cannot see what exactly is happening because it's a lot of traffic. The traffic is full of... Uh, you, you can say that any, any session from other team is maybe malicious. You cannot uh, analyze it uh, fast enough to, uh, to understand what's happening to the service. So, uh, the software which could allow to uh, automatically grab actual shell codes from the network um, traffic would be valuable for us as a team to play in the games. <coughs> and uh, also, we have. Uh, uh, vision for the future use of uh, shellcode detection methods, not uh, signature-based, in the mobile, uh, mobile internet, mobile clients uh, uh, security. Uh, because if we look at what is happening right now in the mobile platform security, we can uh, see that the situation is somewhat similar to what we saw uh, 15 years ago in fixed point security uh, systems uh, when uh, the, the primary uh, the primary risk 
which was analyzed by the administrators or users was how to protect the information on my PC or on my server. Uh, and later, much later, in the beginning of the 2000, uh, of the previous decade, uh, cyber criminals found a ways to, uh, to uh, earn money on the mass exploitation of uh, personal computers without stealing some critical uh, user information. Uh, I mean, building botnets for uh, denial of service attacks, for uh, mass stealing of uh, credit card information, and so on. Uh, and today, mobile platforms, they are already outnumber the number of fixed uh, computers on the inter internet about uh, two or no, four, four degrees ma magnitude. I mean, it's about uh, over one billion devices connected to the inter internet, uh, which are presented by Android, uh, iOS platforms, and so on. And then only about 200 million fixed devices. Uh, and they are maybe not yet interesting for cyber criminals in, in terms of building some large, uh, large volume botnets because they don't have a constant internet connection which may allow to use them as the ordinary botnets are used now. Um, and, and the only thing that may be how um, malware may allow an attacker to earn money on the uh, vulnerable machine is uh, to steal personal data, uh, for example, banking data. Yes, uh, this. And and if the situation is similar to what was 15 years ago in the fixed market, we can imagine that. Uh, it will develop in the similar way in the future uh, when cyber criminals, when, uh, for example, we have uh, full coverage of uh, broadband wireless connections like LTE and so on, uh, and uh, there will be ways to monetize this uh, remote exploitation in, in many ways. And then it will be much more interesting to find uh, server-side, client-side uh, vulnerabilities and exploit them remotely. Uh, if we, so this is the motivation for our work. What we are trying to do, we're trying to combine uh, existing shellcode detection methods which were developed in recent 10 or 15 years by researchers and industry and uh, to allow, uh, to um, build something that may be useful in right now and in the future. I mean, uh, uh, to, do, to do so that uh, solution which we're developing right now will be extendable to allow different uh, architecture platforms, different flavor, uh, operating system flavors, and so on. Um, I will talk a little bit about uh, existing methods for shellcode detection. Uh, they may be uh, split generally in three major groups or types of analysis. Uh, shellcode basically is a program, uh, com computer programs, uh, which is limited in space, uh, I mean, uh, it's, it's not always uh, vulnerability, remotely exploitable vulnerability, and not always allow an attacker to uh, write a lot of data into the address space. And uh, there are, uh, since it's, it, shellcode is a program, it may be analyzed uh, as a program. And uh, there are some differences uh, in how shellcode looks like and uh, how, 
for example, virus on, or, or ordinary normal program like. And people try to uh, detect this specific uh, type of programs uh, in three ways. Uh, there are aesthetic analysis methods, there are dynamic methods, uh, uh, and hybrid combinations of uh, both. Uh, static analysis methods treat the data which they are analyzed uh, as, uh, as a source code of the program, for example, in machine codes. Uh, and uh, this means that uh, for analysis we do not need nothing but the source code. We don't, do not need to run the program to analyze its behavior. Uh, dynamic methods uh, run the program in order to de de detect what what it will actually do. Mm. In the field of uh, shellcode detection, we we may meet uh, signature matching, as uh, it's quite ordinary for antivirus and IDS systems. We may meet such uh, methods like uh, control flow graph or instruction flow graph analysis. Uh, there, are, there were specific methods aiming at uh, knob sled detection, for example. The knob sled is uh, uh, part of the shellcode which contains uh, only uh, instructions which lead the execution down to the actual uh, portion of shellcode which do this uh, stuff which was intended for it. Uh, and uh, dynamic methods uh, all require emulation in some way. Emulation of virtual uh, or execution in the virtual environment, sandboxes and so on. Um, the, they differ theoretically, they differ in uh, code coverage, for example, because static analysis theoretically may allow you to uh, analyze all the branches of code execution. Uh, and, uh, but when we try to analyze shell code without knowing the actual memory state of the machine which is being attacked, uh, it's not always uh, possible to, um, to find out data which is necessary for static analysis. Uh, uh, the values of uh, addresses which will be written or read from the memory and so on. Uh, dynamic analysis is more as if, uh, uh, static analysis very badly behaves when the program is encrypted or packed, for example, self, and then it self decrypts on the uh, endpoint. Dynamic, dynamic analysis allows to uh, avoid these kind of problems uh, and detect, uh, unpack and analyze unpacked code. Uh, when we, so when we finished analyzing exa existing uh, research, we found out that uh, there were tools available on the internet also, like libemo emulator with some kind of shocker detection features in it. It was uh, there was a lip sizzle by George Wichersky, for example, which uh, implemented um, hybrid kind of uh, shocker detection with cat PC code detection and emulation. Further, um, and there was a bunch of research work which we had to implement for ourselves because uh, the code was not available on the internet. And then we analyzed uh, these uh, implementations uh, and, and found out that it's not a, not a surprise. Uh, methods with low computation complexity had uh, high false positives rates. And, meth and vice versa, methods which were good and uh, accurate in detection, uh, tested, for example, on recent Metasploit, uh, they showed very high computation complexity. Uh, what can we do as a user who wants to uh, build 
a system from it to analyze traffic. If we uh, want to defend mobile platform, we cannot run these heavy methods on the endpoint because it consu consumes battery and so on and so on. Uh, and we cannot actually run them on the uh, network appliance because if we go to exact numbers of computational complexity, it, 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 it turns out that, for example, that on some types of the data, the libemo or libsizzle uh, works, uh, processes about two, 200 kilobytes per second on the modern server. Uh, what can you do actually with such kind of methods? But um, we tried, we think, thought, and uh, an idea came to our mind that maybe if we combine these methods in such a way that uh, the, mo the, least, the, mo the fastest methods, the least complex methods will come earlier. And we will be able to um, make the coverage for different types of shellcode on the higher levels of this uh, analyzing framework. And we will make so that the most accurate and heavy methods will be uh, executed on the last stage. We will be able to cut the normal data on the early stage. And therefore, we will run uh, to the execution of the most heavy methods at the end. And thus reduce the complexity of the method. Uh, Svetlana, I'm giving you. Um, so, um, first of all, I've, uh, I've briefly described objects on which we are working on. Um, next, I describe uh, architecture and uh, details of implementation of our prototype. Um, and also show the evaluation and some funny demo, maybe not funny, I don't know. Uh, so, um, in contra uh, it contrasts to uh, viruses which are rich uh, with features, with um, some characteristics. Uh, so code usually have strict s schema. So, uh, for example, here we have um, Little example of shell codes which exploits uh, buffer overflow vulnerability, uh, and uh, in such case, um, shell code uh, should have at least uh, return address zone because we are aim to uh, override return address zone of uh, of our stack uh, with the same value uh, that uh, leads the control of flow somewhere inside our shell code. So, um, is attacker. Uh, uh, may not be aware uh, about some uh, environment uh, of vulnerable machine. Uh, so uh, shell codes usually have uh, some kinds of uh, activator. So uh, it could be a knobslet, it could be uh, some kind of get PC code. Uh, knobslet, as it was mentioned before by my co-speaker, is uh, the set of instructions uh, which typically do nothing but uh, increase in uh, program counter. Uh, but uh, in real life we have a uh, pretty complex knobslet uh, which can do some arithmetical operation, do something on register and so on. Uh, the only requirements uh, it's uh, not to affect uh, control flow of uh, malicious payload. Of, of payload. Uh, so uh, what attacker can also um, do. So uh, usually they want to um, evade uh, simple signature-based detectors. So uh, that's why uh, Shlokot uh, usually Shlokot usually has uh, have uh, some decryptor routine in their schema, and also a payload. Uh, here is some uh, example. It's synthetic example generated by Metasploit framework. Uh, we have. Um, First block of instruction is knobslet. Uh, after that, we have uh, decryptor routine and uh, also encrypted payload, uh, which will be changed during decrypt execution. Um, so, uh, again, um, we have really uh, impressive background on shell code detection area. Uh, so, uh, we have a bunch of algorithms uh, which are characterized of at least 
four issues. It's execution time, it's false positive rate, it's false negative rate. Um, and also, um, let's imagine that we have different classes of shell code. So uh, we also can compare our algorithms um, uh, with the feature how well and how many shell code classes they, uh, they are able to detect. So, um, and given all that stuff, why don't we try to construct some optimal classifier, which uh, will be uh, optimal in terms of execution time, uh, which will be optimal in terms of false positive rate. Uh, and we are also interested in detecting everything we want, we can possibly detect. So, um, such, uh, such optimal classifier, such optimal solution should also uh, provide complete class coverage. Uh, so, um, during our analysis, <coughs> we um, we identified, we analyzed several research papers describing uh, shell code detection algorithms, several research papers describing how to uh, exploit memory cor corruption vulnerabilities and so on. Uh, so, uh, what we've noticed, we have, uh, typically we have uh, for several shell codes, we have um, some features. They can be static, they can be dynamic. So uh, static features uh, is features that, uh, uh, which presence can be detected only by static analysis. Uh, dynamic features can be detected by dynamic analysis only. So um, here is uh, some examples of uh, static features. Uh, of course, the list could be much, much bigger. Um, we have two types of features. It's generic, it's specific. Um, as, again, as it was mentioned before, uh, shell code, it's a program. So uh, generic features uh, typically uh, relies on uh, the fact that shell code is, is a program. Uh, so um, it was uh, some research papers describing that um, if some piece of data, uh, this assembled is uh, into instruction of uh, some certain number of, uh, in the chain of some certain number of instruction, uh, it should have, uh, it, it could possibly do something significant. So if we have less number of instruction, we could do nothing with them. It's, it's just random instruction. So um, in their work, it was 14 uh, instruction. So uh, we could use such heuristic. We also can uh, look at a uh, number of Pascal patterns uh, is very limited uh, by the size of uh, buffer. We have um, we have limitation on size and so on. Specific features uh, usually relies on uh, the presence of knobslet, uh, presence of decrypt routine, uh, present um, typical for non uh, ISLR systems, and so on. Uh, well, here's example of dynamic features. Uh, we also have a uh, generic one, we also have specific one. It could be boring. Uh, okay, so uh, what do we have now? We have some set of features. Um, and we want to split uh, overall um, shell code space into some maybe uh, particularly overlapping classes. Uh, well, um, we have a requirement that uh, each class uh, should be identified by a unique set of shell code features. Uh, so uh, they could be overlapping, uh, and uh, thus uh, every feature can be reflected to several cl classes simultaneously. I'm sorry. Um, well, um, let's consider a simple example. It's um, let's consider classes of multi-byte uh, uh, equivalent let's show codes. Um, again, as a program, we have some set of uh, common features that. It should disassemble is into a chain of relevant size. Uh, it shouldn't exceed uh, size limitation. So uh, as uh, it multibyte, no equivalence that uh, shell codes, we should have multibyte instructions surprisingly. Uh, and um, we also have a requirement that uh, we, uh, we need such uh, shell codes to be correct disassembled uh, from each and every byte of set. Because uh, if we put our um, control flow to the wrong byte of set, we uh, should be certain that we will reach malicious payload correctly. 
Uh, well, um, depending on uh, those features, uh, we could uh, present uh, some set of uh, so-called classes. They could be grouped uh, on some meta classes like activator-based classes, uh, payload-based classes, return address-based classes, decryptor-based classes, and so on. Uh, here is some example. Uh, again, we could have uh, classes of shell codes which contains only shell codes with x90 uh, knobslet. Uh, knobslet could be uh, more smart, uh, more more difficult detectable. Uh, so we could have uh, uh, classes of shell codes which contains one byte knob equivalent length, multi byte uh, knob equivalent length, and so on. Um, it could also be a trampoline slate, which consists of uh, jump instruction. So uh, if we put our control flow somewhere in such an upslet, we, we are sure that we will reach a malicious payload in one single step. Uh, so, but um, unfortunately, it's, uh, such shell codes uh, can be detected by uh, simple signature-based uh, detectors very easy. Uh, so uh, sometimes uh, malicious guys uh, do some obfuscation on such such that, and so on. Um, well, here is example of uh, payload based classes. So we could have plain and obfuscated shell codes. Uh, shell codes with different obfuscation. Um, the first one to one, two, three, four, five uh, bullets stands for polymorphic obfuscation of shell codes. It's interesting also to consider metamorphic shell codes, uh, which provides a two level of, of obfuscation. Uh, well, uh, in polymorphic shell codes, we have a strict kernel of a program, and we do some obfuscation on those that strict kernel. In metamorphic, we uh, first of all we change uh, the kernel of the program, and after that we. Um, we can apply some uh, polymorphic modification. So we have two levels of obfuscation. Um, and, uh, again, here is an uh, example of, of uh, decryptor based and uh, return address based classes. So um, they can be uh, unpacking, self unpacking, self secret, uh, non self contained, which are trying to um, execute malicious payload from different memory locations, and also return. Mm, address zone based classes. So um, it was object on which we are working. Uh, here's um, uh, some information about our prototype. Sorry. Um, okay. Um, well, uh, when uh, we looked on existing uh, so called detection algorithms, uh, we've noticed that uh, complex algorithms uh, usually have uh, um, pretty difficult heuristic inside of it and pretty di difficult um, uh, well typical routines maybe oh. um, uh, they they have really pretty difficult heuristic and uh, they communicate with each other in difficult in complicated way uh, so uh, first of all, we tried to uh, to take several existing shell code detection algorithms and to try to decompile and decomposite them uh, into simple heuristics uh, of um, uh, which they are trying to detect well during their analysis. Uh, so um, now we have. Uh, unfortunately, we can't implement everything we found, so uh, we have uh, several algorithms that implemented and decomposited. So. Uh, here we have uh, some set of uh, detectors of uh, such heuristics uh, or features. Uh, moreover, we implemented uh, simple detectors of uh, features that I uh, explained in the several previous slides. Well, um, we have detectors. Uh, moreover, we noticed that um, during their analysis, all existing algorithms um, uh, using common uh, common steps like uh, they all need to disassemble byte flow uh, they all uh, several of them needs to reconstruct control flow graph from the disassembled byte flow or instruction flow graph or something else so um, it seems reasonable for us to implement uh, our tool um, 
as a uh, shell code detection library as a part of our tool uh, in such a way that is shown on the current slide. Well, okay, uh, now we have shell code detection library with the set of elementary classifiers. Um, we formulated uh, the task uh, of um, detection uh, shell code. Um, of formulating the task of construction uh, hybrid shell code detector uh, of, uh, that uh, will provide uh, complete class coverage that will be optimal in terms of um, false positive rate, false negative rate, and execution time. Uh, in such a way that uh, we're trying to construct a directed graph uh, and uh, the set of uh, vertices represented by elementary classifiers, uh, arcs re represented by uh, arcs represented uh, data flow between elementary classifiers. Well, um, such graphs should have several levels. Uh, each, each level uh, represented by uh, different uh, elementary classifiers, which are detect uh, different shell code classes. Well, um, and two levels can be connected on. Uh, very specific way. Uh, for example, uh, let's consider one elementary classifiers which are able to detect uh, no such presence in the byte flow. And consider elementary, elementary classifier which are able to detect the presence of get PC code. How can we compare them? There's no way to do it. It's, uh, it's seem, it doesn't seem reason, reasonable at all. Uh, so we can connect only those classifiers which are able to detect uh, overlapping classes of shell codes. So, um, the other idea was um, uh, how, how, can we, how can we try to optimize um, optimize time, optimize uh, execution time of uh, our detector? Well, the um, idea was the following. Um, let's consider we have some elementary classifier. Uh, if we pass uh, malicious samples through it, uh, elementary classifier pass uh, that malicious sample to the other classifiers to double check it. But if we have a legitimate flow and some elementary classifier concludes that flow is legitimate, we are not passing it uh, through elementary classifier, such we are able to um, reduce legitimate flow as fast as possible. Uh, and um, thus, another uh, significant idea was to put uh, less, complica less complicated classifiers on the top of topology so we can reduce legitimate flow on the early stage of execution of the tool. Well, um, how are we building such classifier? We are given um, the entire set of elementary classifier. Uh, on, the every, uh, on the every step, we choose uh, some combination of elementary classifiers from it, uh, and uh, we are saying that it will be the next level <coughs> of our hybrid classifier. Uh, at the uh, next step, we're trying to um, to link uh, different lawyers, a new lawyer with uh, other graph, uh, and uh, we removing the new uh, the, uh, classifiers from the new level from entire set and repeat that step so many times uh, before we have uh, well we have uh, some elementary classifier from which we can construct uh, the next lawyer. What uh, <laughs> levels? I'm sorry. <laughs> so, um, how can we select um, classifiers for the next level? Um, well, um, we have again we have entire set of elementary classifiers. They are able to detect some subset of so-called uh, so-called classes. Um, we are constructing. All possible combinations of uh, elementary classifier which are able to detect such a uh, subset of so called classes. And after that, we are selecting uh, the most optimal combination, which are optimal in terms of false positive rate and time complexity. Uh, well, um, it's, uh, we have uh, at least two significant goals in our work. Uh, we wanted to detect uh, every class that we can possibly detect. Uh, we wanted to uh, minimize false positive rates. So um, it seems uh, very native that uh, proposed uh, linear topology 
can solve all our problems. Uh, in such topology, we uh, we execute in every elementary classifier to another, but uh, the only requirement that we are not able to reduce legitimate flow. So uh, every elementary classifier double checking the, the output of previous classifier, uh, and uh, after that decision making model uh, analyzes all output from all classifiers and deciding that sample is legitimate or sample is malicious. Unfortunately, it's slow. Um, well, um, but uh, that's why it seems reasonable for us to have such linear topology as base, uh, baseline in our evaluation. Uh, here's a slide with boring numbers. Uh, while you're looking at those boring numbers, I try to explain data sets. Uh, so uh, we compared our linear topol uh, our hybrid topology with linear topology on four different data sets. It was uh, exploit generated by Metasploit framework. Uh, it was something about 2,000 samples. Uh, well, they were they were polymorphic. They were encrypted and so on. We tried to do everything we can do. Uh, so um, it also was a data set of benign binaries. It was uh, Windows P and Linux elves. Uh, it was random data, and uh, it also was multimedia data set. Uh, it can be strange, but uh, during our work, we n we've noticed that uh, some existing shell code detection algorithms have failed to uh, recognize uh, part of multimedia to be legitimate. Uh, so they have really huge um, uh, false positive rate. So uh, it seems interesting for us uh, how uh, such approach uh, can behave on multimedia also. Well, here's maybe a less boring visualization of boring numbers. Um, blue line stands for uh, linear topology. Uh, which color is it? Brown line stands for uh, our hybrid topology. And the very first pl plot uh, explains uh, exploit data set. Um, as we can see, uh, the difference uh, on exploits data set uh, is not uh, really significant. Um, in ideal world, uh, if uh, every classifier uh, can, um, uh, if every classifier have uh, has uh, zero false negative rate, so uh, we should have the picture when we have uh, similar lines on that plot. But unfortunately, uh, sometimes classifiers uh, failed to recognize shell code, so um, that's why uh, we were worried a bit uh, how well uh, our tool will work in terms of false negative rate, uh, but boring, uh, boring numbers shows us that it's still okay because of other elementary classifiers. So, and uh, moreover, we have a little profit in time complexity, and we have much, much bigger profit on legitimate data set, uh, and the biggest uh, profit on the multimedia. Uh, at the multimedia data set, uh, hybrid topology boosts linear topology up to 45 times. Uh, so here's a couple of use cases for the tool. Uh, it can be implemented uh, as part of some IDS or IPS systems. Uh, well, uh, in a way, like it show on the current slide. So um, if hybrid uh, hybrid detector uh, concludes that some packet have uh, has malicious payload, we can simply drop it. So um, that's why uh, we can possibly um, use it for uh, for detection of unknown zero days. Uh, and also, it's experience of uh, CTF participation. Uh, when we can try to get information from other team to monitor what what's going on in our game network. Uh, now I have a little demonstration how it works. Okay, um, the tool is open source. It's uh, available on Gitaris repository. Uh, well, here. Here demonstrating how to build it, use it from scratch. How fancy is he make? Fancy, fancy make. Now in colors. <laughs> <coughs> Uh, 
Uh, well, uh, it's use case how uh, we can use such tool on detecting something in, in the network level. Uh, so uh, we can detect, as we can see, okay, there was plain shell codes, shell codes contained in, contained not flat and so on. Uh, and here example, how can we detect uh, something in files? Uh, we used uh, malicious files generated by a Metasploit from work. We used different models of Metasploit. So um, we, we should see different classes of detected shell codes. Here we have plain shell code and knob shell code. Uh, still plain. Okay. Also shell codes which contains some decryptor. So. Huh. Here we go. Um, our tool named Morpheus could be found on GitHub repository. Uh, here is some information about me and my speaker. Oh, yeah. Such email addresses. The URL is a little bit unreadable here. Yeah? <laughs> okay, I'll try to do this. Uh, if, 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 no. <laughs> Okay. No, no. Oh, here. Still no. Just click the mouse there and the pop up will show the link. Exploited! Now, appear soon! <laughs> no speed. Okay. Well, uh, the things which we can add that uh, this implementation was made for uh, Intel architecture 32 bits only, but uh, we're currently trying to extend a to uh, ARM thumb architecture um, and 64-bit uh, Intel architecture. Uh, uh, if uh, you have any questions, please feel free to ask them uh, right now or maybe afterwards. Thank you. Yeah? So there, there is a question. Uh, the false positives uh, yeah. uh, here be in the yeah. slides. So uh, it's close to zero. Close to zero. Yeah. Uh, the comparison was between linear topology we were, when we were running every uh, every detector one afterwards, and comparing to this linear topology is almost the same. So we are gaining about 40 times w without reducing uh, accuracy much. Yeah. 